This month, we interviewed Amit Serper, principal security researcher at Cyber Reason, about his research into Pirate, malicious Mac adware that has resurfaced recently. We'll talk about how the malware was discovered, why Mac users should care, and how to avoid getting infected. Amit, thank you for joining us. I understand that your investigation into Pirit started in 2016 when a friend contacted you because his Mac was acting strangely, and there seemed to have been a new user account on his Mac that he didn't create. Can you tell us more about that? When he looked into it, he saw that this user actually has root privileges. So he was very alarmed by that because he had a, a user that he, you know, he, he never saw on his machine running programs that he never installed. His machine was really slow. He had ads every, like he saw ads everywhere you go. And on top of it all, the user had root privileges. So at that time, I was like, "Hey, that sounds interesting. Let's play." And then I asked him to send me a bunch of files, and then I just end up sitting the entire night reverse engineering this thing. And that's how the story started. And then I did a write up on it. It got some publicity. I even I spoke about it in some conferences, both in the U.S. and in Israel. About a month and a half later, after I did all of the talks, someone contacted me because I wrote a removal script, which I put on GitHub. And someone contacted me and said, "Hey." Uh, the script you wrote doesn't work anymore. They have they released a new version. Here is a link to the sample of the new version. And I was like, okay, I'll look into it. And the thing is, I was too lazy to spin up my uh, my uh, research VM. And I'll just interject here for aspiring security researchers: don't try this at home. Of course, it's best practice to work with potentially malicious files inside a protected environment to avoid infecting your own computer. And I was like. I won't extract the files because it was, it was a TarGZ archive that the guy sent me a TarGZ archive. That's one of the, it's one of the files that's dropped to the machine by period. And I was like, I'm too lazy to spin up my um, test VM. So instead of extracting the file, I'll just list the files inside the archive. And that was a really like, that was a eureka moment because what happened is, what happens is with a TarGZ archive, the way that the format works is that it saves exactly all of the permissions mm -hmm. and of the files as they were on the machine that created the file that, that created the, the archive. So if you list the files inside the archive while it's still closed, you can see all the permissions and you can see the even the username that owns the permissions to the file. I, I listed the file inside the archive. I was like, okay, YOLO. And the owner, the username that was in there was a full name, like a full name and last name. And from the beginning, I knew that whoever did hear it, like it was that whoever behind it has something to do with Israel because mm -hmm. all of the certificates that were used to sign the malware had Israeli names on them. And the name that appeared inside the archive was also an Israeli name. And, you know, being Israeli, I, I know how to spot Israeli names. So I immediately, I was like, oh my, what just happened? So I go to LinkedIn, I just write that name in there. And I found, and I found out that, you know, that name belongs to VPRD at a company called Targeting Edge. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Uh -huh. And then I look, I look up Targeting Edge on LinkedIn and like I get a, a page, like a company page, very minimal, hardly any information in there. But the description of the company, their product matched exactly the description of what Pirate does, which is monetizing traffic off of Mac users. And at that point, I realized that I found out who the authors of the malware were. And then a few months after, after I moved to the States, I, uh, I talked about it in RSA, RSA uh, 2017, RSA conference in San Francisco, which is where uh, you and I met, I think. Right. And, um, and then I, I talked about how I found it. And the amazing thing about the story is like, this is like the gift that keeps on giving because a couple of weeks after RSA, I received an email from our uh, recruiter from the Tel Aviv office with a resume. And she's asking me, Hey, does this resume, like th that name sounds familiar. Right. And I remember you mentioned this name. Who is this guy? So I look at the resume, and his name was also found at the drop files. I found two names, and the other guy was just a programmer. And the programmer sent us his resume, and in his resume, he clearly wrote like I, that he worked for Targeting Edge. The first bullet in that line, which we, we blurred out everything but that line and put it in the new report, 
he basically said my work appeared on a cyber reason labs article which is the articles i wrote about parrot yeah he was taking credit for writing what um most people in the security industry would consider malware it's yes yeah. So what, what's really interesting to me about Pirit is that it's not just um, your typical adware, right? Like the, the kinds of adware that normally would be described as adware would be things like um, maybe they would hijack your, your browser searches or things like that. Um, or basically it's doing things, putting ads on your screen or other things that could help this company basically to make money, right? That's that's yeah. like your typical example of adware. And in this case, what Pirate was doing, as you described, is is gaining root privileges and behaving in ways that typically a, your, your generic adware would not, but that software could then do really anything it wanted to do with your system. Yes. So um, the thing about adware in general, so adware, as annoying as it is, almost in all of the cases... There are very, uh, because again, adware, companies that make adware are, are, again, they're software companies. They have to uh, uh, abide to some rules and they have to follow, you know, regulations and everything. And usually um, if, you, um, if you'll go to a website of a company that makes adware, you'll often find their te- terms of service and the privacy policy and um, instructions on how to uninstall the adware. You'll find that in almost every website of a company that makes adware. Different thing about Parrot and Targeting Edge, the company that makes this uh, malware, and, and again, I'm using the term malware because adware is just malware with a legal department, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which yeah, I can talk about that too. You go to their website and there is nothing over there. There's, there you don't have any information about what the software does. You don't have any privacy policy, any uh, end user license agreement, any instructions on how to remove the software. Like there is nothing. Their website is basically like a generic website with nothing in it. Uh, I was told by journalists who covered the story and tried to contact the company. So they have a, a, an email address in their website, um, info at targetingedge.com. They tried emailing this address and all the emails bounced back. So <laughs> even even the, the email address doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So in the case of Parrot, the reason why I didn't know when I was, you know, when I started researching it, I didn't know who's behind it is because they are hiding it very well. Like they are hiding their connection to Parrot very, very well. All of the um, all of the names that were used on the on the certificates to sign the files from last year, all of them were bogus names, and they had tons of certificates. I was in contact with Apple and I um, I gave Apple every day a list of certificates. They revoked the certificates and like 25, 30 minutes later, um, they had a new installer up with new certificates. It was oh, amazing. Wow. All of their domains, um, all the domains that the malware was contacting were domains that looked like something that's called DGA, Domain Generation Algorithm, mm-hmm. which is basically a domain that looks like some sort of a hash that doesn't make any sense but the person who controls and registers that domain um, has an algorithm that generates these domain names and allows him to predict and control the name of, of domains. So all the domains I saw had this weird pattern. And when you do, uh, when you're trying to get the who is listing on a domain, you hit a dead end because they were registered with, uh, with privacy guard. Mm-hmm. So you can't even know who registered the domains. And anywhere you look, you can't find any connection to targeting edge. And again, unless I was too lazy to unpack, you know, to list the, the files inside the archive, I would have never found them. It's kind of fascinating. As a malware researcher, sometimes you come across information in the strangest place. It's something that then, once you know how to do it that way, you can add that to your list of things that you check for next time around. And of course, they're yeah. probably going to be a little bit more careful about how they zip things in the in the future. Yeah, they did. In, in, the, in this version, actually, there are no names inside the files. Now, the owner of the file is a user called Batman. So, uh, <laughs> so no names anymore. Yeah. Uh, another, thing, another thing that they did was they are hiding themselves on your machine as well. So when they're installing themselves on your machine, they are creating a launch agent. Now, a launch agent is, in Mac speak, is what, it's what's called an auto run, which basically it's something that allows the program... Uh, to have persistence on your machine so that it will run again the next time you reboot the machine. In macOS, launch agents are basically files that are in specific location on your system. 
And those files follow a naming convention on Apple that's called, that's called the uh, reverse domain notation. And that's basically how you know which launch agent belongs to what program. They called their launch agents com.apple. and then a random name that they generated every time the malware was installed. So they're pretending they, to be Apple software. Yes, exactly. And they did that, um, one, to pretend that they're, uh, this is a file that was created by Apple as a part of uh, an update or, you know, some sort of a, a system file. And another reason why they chose the random name is that, that it won't be um, identical on every install. So, like, if I will be infected and if you'll be infected, the name would, of the file would be different. Like, it could be on my machine, it could be com.apple.randomwork1. And on your machine, it will be com.apple.randomwork2. So that it'll make it hard for me as a security researcher to find out what are the names of the, of the files. Now, this latest version of Pirate, how is it getting onto users' machines? Like, are, are they going to a website and, you know, getting offered a new version of Flash Player? Or how, how is it being distributed? So according to my research from last year and uh, how you get infected, so what I found, I found uh, two possibilities of getting infected. One is the simple way of, uh, well, it's always by an installer. So let's say you go to a download website, you want to download a program, you go to Google, you type, I don't know, uh, QuickTime Player or Adobe <laughs> Flash Reader download. Usually the first or second result you'll get is to a website that it's like a download website, you know? It's like they have all mm -hmm. sorts of programs and you download the programs from them. The way that those download websites, there are a lot of those, like, you know, download.com and Softonic, and you have lots of websites. And the way that they work is they work with companies like Targeting Edge, like Iron Source, like other installer, they call it like uh, software monetization companies. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they create an installer which wraps the software. So you use that installer to install the software in your machine and you get the program and then some. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and the then some is, you know, that adware or like a toolbar or whatever you have in your machine. So that's one way of getting infected. The other way which I found, I found the targeting edges installers and other website. Um, I went to a torrent website. And I found this by looking at several uh, threat intelligence sources and, and, and crossing some sources. And I found out that there was a site that was allegedly distributing cracks for all sorts of, of, of software. The thing is that there was never any crack in what you were downloading. So um, <laughs> if, you, if you think that you're downloading a crack to Microsoft Office for Mac, which is the example I used in my talk from, from last year, you'll get an installer that's called like uh, Microsoft Word 2017 crack. And you'll think that you're installing a, a crack, but you're actually not installing anything but their malware. So inside an installer, there was nothing but their malware. The way that they did it in torrent sites, if you ever visit a torrent sites, you'll notice there are a lot of weird ads on those websites. And oftentimes when you'll go to the page where you're actually supposed to download the torrent, you'll see a download button that's huge and green. It's like almost half your screen and it says download mm -hmm. now. Right. And you'll think that this is the, the button that you need to press in order to download the torrent that you want to download. But it isn't actually, it's just an ad. And it looks in a way, it, look, it looks like that. So, you know, it would entice you to click that button instead of the smaller original download button. That's how you get infected as well. So they, there are all sorts of, of, of tactics on how to get infected. So what's the takeaway for the average end user? Is the answer to just only get your software from the Mac App Store or iOS App Store? Either the, the Mac App Store or the website of the original developer. There were several cases where even the original website was was hacked and, uh, you know, some ransomware were put in there or another malware, which I researched was called Proton B, mm -hmm. uh, was put in there. I think it was the handbrake video. And code right. that, that happens too. But that is significantly rarer than, you know, going to a website like Softonic or all of those websites and downloading the software from there. So if you know that you need to download, I don't know, VLC um, Media Player or something, mm -hmm. go to VLC's website. Don't download it off a third-party website. Always go to the, to the vendor's website, to the original uh, software creator's website, download your software from there. If you can't find the software on the uh, Mac App Store, always prefer using the Mac App Store. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the, you taking the time to, to meet with us today and appreciate the, the, the tips on how our listeners, viewers can stay safe. 
Sure. And remember, adware is malware with a legal department. Don't don't <laughs> dismiss the threats of adware. They're just as bad. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit like and subscribe and share it with your friends and family to help them stay protected. Are you keeping your Mac protected? Intego has been keeping Macs safe since 1997. And now you can get a free trial of Intego's Mac Premium Bundled X9 at Intego.com. As our way of saying thank you for subscribing and sharing this video, we're offering you 50% off when you use the promo code IntegoYT at checkout.